All right, so let's continue on here with Kelly Oliver's uh, Witnessing Beyond Recognition. A few things to say first. Uh, you can find this on anywhere or anywhere you get your podcasts. You can also follow me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. You can contribute if you want. It'd be greatly appreciated if you have the means, of course, on Patreon or PayPal. I want to give a shout out to Nicholas, Matt, Sebastian, John, Boz, James, and Ashley, who have all been really instrumental in keeping this going. Uh, and if you can't contribute monetarily, obviously that's totally fine like share subscribe you know leave comments i like to hear from you uh in order to get like an engagement going now here we're going to start from chapter five in this text having just finished up with chapter four obviously uh, and i didn't mention this in the last one but i'm going to have timestamps in the comments or in the uh description so that if you just need to read a certain chapter hopefully you could be able to find it pretty easily with that so we're going to start here with chapter five titled false witnesses in which Oliver considers the way that some people, um, especially those in the position of the oppressor, don't, we, we should be careful not to listen to them in the same ways that we listen to people who are oppressed. So like we talked about in the first um, half, especially considering the way that uh, Franz Fanon would write about the oppressed's experience in relation to the colonizer, as being a process of subject subjectivating or becoming subject of this oppressed person and that coming about by listening to them as a kind of subject, how we can't just extend this to everyone. So for Oliver, quite simply, we cannot uh, kind of extend an olive branch to people who are working through it with an oppressive agenda to try and attain some degree of acknowledgement or a, some degree of subjectivity, like neo-Nazis or something. They do not, uh, they should not be considered in the same camp of subjectivity as these other people, because these people claim to be uh, kind of fighting for something when in fact they're just existing within a system that already benefits them in many in many ways. So these people are, as the title suggests, false witnesses. Because to witness does not only imply an individual act, that is an act conducted by a single person looking at themselves and the world. This is something that exists almost holistically within a certain social dynamic. So we cannot separate the two. In that case, anyone whose interest is in oppressing others is not... Uh, you know, existing within an ethical relationship at the intersection of responsibility and addressability. And they therefore should not be considered in this in this same framework. So reactionaries, you know, people, reactionaries are people that uh, react to other people claiming or, or demanding more rights. You know, they say, no, I am the one that, that is oppressed, are not people that are working through you know, that Freudian concept that we presented in the first half, these are just people that are acting out. They're just responding aggressively because they feel themselves to be attacked. So this is certainly what happened in the United States when it came down to people opposing affirmative action policies. So specifically, um, Oliver writes about I-200, which in California, I-200, which passed in California, that was a law put into effect to stop preferential treatment of women or people of color. So this was an anti-affirmative action move. So this was an attack on affirmative action. So, of course, such a move forgets that white people have historically benefited and thrived in institutional life. They have always had affirmative action, more or less. So there's a tendency, and this is a very uh, strategic move on the part of reactionaries, especially in this context, in that they appropriate the discourse of, say, Martin Luther King, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., of course, who advocates for equality. So these people take that and they're like, well, if there was true equality, then we wouldn't need affirmative action, because if there was true equality, then you know, affirmative action is just another form of oppression. Now, of course, that is just a kind of dog whistle for other like-minded people to, you know, drum up their hate of anyone who isn't white, who who gets, you know, a job 
before them, like someone, a person of color who happens to get like a promotion before a deserving white person or a person who feels themselves to be the deserving uh, receivers of that, of that raise or promotion. Now, of course, these people do not care about equality or else they would care about the fact that there is a disproportionate percentage of white people that occupy various um, like high authority positions in all sectors in, in the United States and Canada, you know, ev everywhere where there, this tension exists. Um, and they, of course, at those points, they do not advocate for equality, right? Because they are not the ones affected. So then she gives another example of Chicago, where only 1% of contracts, that is by the city, were given to black contractors, even though the city was almost half black. Now, the Supreme Court shot this case down on the condition that it would be impossible to quantify the harm done to black Americans, and therefore they cannot come up with a solution. So the problem was that, uh, you know, people brought up this lawsuit that the uh, it was shown that Chicago was only giving contracts to 1%. 1% of the people they were giving contracts to were, were black, where, you know, black people make up 50% of the population. So they're like, clearly there's some kind of discrimination going on here. There is an ample supply of black contractors. Why is it that white people seem to only want to be working with other white people? This must be a racist thing. And the problem there was that, of course, the Supreme Court shot that um, kind of lawsuit down because it said you can't possibly quantify, you know, the, the the harm done to black people and how to necessarily then compensate for that, how to then uh, pay that back, which is obviously reveals that there's a huge problem. Like you can't even quantify it. It's just so extreme. Like, and anyways, now this is the problem of like post-racist uh, or post-racism colorblindness. So when people say like, I don't see color, what they're really saying is that I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to deal with the fact that racism still exists because you can be very sure that there are many people that still do see color and that color that they see will determine how they're going to treat that person. Where, you know, so many studies have been done where uh, people are applying for jobs, put on the resume like a, a name that might be stereotypically associated with a person of color, like a black person or someone from the Middle East or something. And then they'll, you know, be sending out the same resume, but with a, a, a name that might be like have its European roots. And the person with the European roots is the one that's always selected. So can we really say, well, I, I can't say always selected, but like the data shows that the vast majority of the time, uh, they are the one that is selected. And so we must say like, well, is colorblindness really a thing? Because it really seems like it isn't. So it'd be inc incredibly naive for us to think that colorblindness mounts any kind of effective criticism against uh, racism as it manifests itself today. So here then, that's the, the false witnesses are then those people that claim to be oppressed when in fact they, they aren't. They're existing within the very oppressive system that they decry or feel themselves to be victims of. Now here we are into chapter six now titled History, Transformation, and Vigilance. So in response to the kind of racist, um, you know, normalcy that we saw in the, the previous chapter, uh, Oliver calls for like extreme analysis, right? Interpretation and, in, and, and reinterpretation, right? So that we can never be fully satisfied. We can never say we've arrived at the post-racist moment. We've, we've arrived at post-sexism because that can't, it, that's not going to happen. You know, we have to be realistic about this. And that's why it demands vigilance, a term she now introduces in this chapter as that act it is a it is a response to the demands of otherness where someone who is othered and this is a really good exercise where there is a tendency especially among people who are relatively privileged let's say you know white uh young men that might be educated who if who if someone confides in them about the oppression that they experience tend to try and rationalize it right like say oh well that's just you know an individual instance that doesn't stand in for the whole and therefore you're being irrational or paranoid by thinking that this could possibly be like a systemic thing and you know these people mount very good arguments about it which could just come down to sophistry who knows i'm not gonna make that charge but the really important exercise is to actually 
learn how to shut up, and to just listen. Now, that's just the first step here, right, in what Oliver is saying. To be able to listen, that is, to be addressable, to be there. Now, the next step is to be able to, you know, return some kind of um, what what someone is like confiding in you to be able to return with some confidence a wholehearted belief in what the person is saying and it's in this way that vigilance is a response to the demands of otherness when the other comes to me and asks for help i should listen i mean this is our our you know north american european kind of christian roots tells us that hey this is what we should do if we think of, I don't know why I'm talking about this, but so many, you know, fervent Jesus followers don't actually believe any of this stuff, which is, would seem like the Jesus thing to do. But anyways, so what does this mean for history, right? Because if there are facts, like in history, how do we engage with these facts? How do we engage with our engagement with history? So for Oliver, the only way we can really engage or motivate uh, uh, you know, the move into a better future is by, you know, looking at our past. So coming to terms with not only the present social situation, that is recognizing, you know, our privileged positions or not privileged positions, listening to others, you know, all of these things, but also being able to look to the past and recognize that Many, much of the things that have happened in the past can teach us a lot about the future, obviously, but even the way that we look at the past might be determined by the future. So this is the argument that the future actually determines the past, where what we look for in the future, or sorry, in the past is motivated by what we want for the future. So, for example, if there is an oppressed group that is trying to imagine a brighter future for themselves. The history that they were taught, let's t let's say racism in um, or sl slavery in the United States, the history that they were taught is often you know uh, whitewashed. It's often diluted in order to be you know as clean as possible to sanitize it. So history it then changes as soon as we put our set our eyes on what we want the future to be. We want the future to be more inclusive. We want the future to be more representative of, uh, you know, certain people's experiences, that is, black Americans, in the face of oppression. So then history takes on a new form because suddenly we're not looking at history the same way. So it's in that way that the future can actually shape and determine the past. And this starts at a refusal of, quote-unquote, historical facts. Now, this isn't to say that facts aren't real like facts are facts but it's also about looking beyond the facts behind what motivations have these facts been considered facts and behind what kind of motivations have uh, other considerations been ignored like the one about um, the jewish woman in the holocaust mentioned in the last episode why is it that we do not consider her subject position why is it that we are only interested in the quote unquote quote unquote truth of the matter. Now, one of the really uh, good ways to kind of challenge this is to challenge the kind of li linear idea that we have of history, you know, the chronological one, the chronos that we have of history. And one way she does that is by looking at the work of Chandra Mohanty, who essentially locates the emphasis on linear history to a kind of Eurocentric model. So she opposes European history with historicity, which allows for negotiation and contestation. So historicity is kind of, is not just looking at what has happened in the past. Historicity looks at the question of history itself, you know, and it begs, that begs the question. It asks the question, uh, through what mechanisms does history actually take a form as a study? Why is it that we learn, want to learn things about the past? What is it about this kind of continual tracing of, of, of roots and, and genealogy that we are so fascinated with. Why, why do we do that? Which are all these questions that come up as soon as we consider historicity. So historicity is then more than just kind of adding the experiences of people who have been ignored to the history books, right? So adding 
um, you know, the, the experiences of oppressed people to the history books, because that doesn't get at the core of what history is doing. That is, it is still proposing that history is a very linear thing, when that is certainly not the case. It's just presented to us in this way in order to make it digestible. Because no individual instance in all throughout all of human history is just determined by like a single cause. It, because that would be, of course, a linear narrative where one thing affects another, which affects another and another, and then you could trace it. But there are a multitude of things always acting upon any given person, event, thing, idea that make it so difficult to actually do this thing called history, to, to find the history of a thing. So because that, you know, history is actually comprised of all of these multiple factors that, that act upon something, historical facts are quite boring. So we have a fact the, that uh, in the Jewish, um, in, at, at, sorry, at Auschwitz, there were four chimneys that, exp there was, sorry, there was just one chimney that exploded, not four. Historical fact, right? We can wash our hands of it and move on. But what are we ignoring when we say that what are we ignoring when we are discounting these subject positions that is these eyewitnesses who are saying otherwise what can we learn from that too what can we learn from these other forces in that moment instead of just looking at the historical fact which is really myopic that is it's a tunnel it's tunnel vision you know you're just looking at a single instance and none of the other causes and it's from there we move here into seeing chapter seven titled seeing race so this kind of historical emphasis on seeing things that have quote unquote happened or were true has historically meant that that thing had significance that thing held some power so visibility was associated with power now oliver troubles that a little bit by saying that of course being visible is a good thing look at the time of like kings like, it was all about visibility. Look at the time now. Like, those with power want to be seen. At least some of them do, right? There are a lot of people that pull the uh, the, the, the puppet, puppet strings without necessarily coming into public view. And they aren't, like, conspirators. They're just people that have a great deal of influence that we don't know about, quite simply. Now, vision does not always imply that you are seeing someone who has power. Sometimes those people that have no power are made hyper visible so this is something experienced by oppressed people where in her words the desire to be seen to be recognized as the paradoxical desire created by oppression and this is necessarily intertwined with a kind of um with property relations that is the relationship between people who can own wealth or own property and have wealth and those people that do not where those people that do not are the ones that are seen right they exist uh, they're, they're, too, they're, they're too present, like they're too much in your face, like homelessness, for instance, where the homeless person is what draws the eyes of all the other people on the street, while at the same time, they're not seen, right? It's kind of the paradox of sight, like we see oppression, but we choose not to recognize it, we choose not to see it. So another way to think about this is in terms of the, uh, like the male gaze, where the male gaze, uh, Laura Mulvey's idea about the kind of voyeuristic tendency of film to depict women in certain ways, often through the perspective of a man, that is the um, kind of odd, takes it, assumes the role of the audience to some extent, to always focus the gaze on women. And that, of course, has certain effects. That is, it produces consequences that women are forced to then uh, abide by or certain standards that women are forced to abide by. So it's in that way as well that vision is a tool for oppression. Now, this relates to another thinker named uh, Patricia Williams, who talks about what the pornographic seeing, which is what the kind of seeing that objectifies. Pornographic seeing is the seeing that reduces others to a kind of uh, fascinating other, you know, the romanticized other, which often happens when we consider other things like, uh, you know, Orientalism through uh, Edward Said, when we represent, you know, the, the quote-unquote exotic or those people that just exist in other, you know, temporalities and in other, other uh, spatialities that don't follow the same kind of, or don't have the same kind of regimen as us or as anyone else. 
So we must then interrogate vision to some extent, because vision is often used as a tool for oppression to maintain these kinds of relations. But with that being said, she still wants to reserve a place for vision as a good thing, like like was mentioned in the first episode. And that here moves us into chapter 8, titled Vision and Recognition, in which she's going to try and do just that. So here she's trying to think about the way that vision can be seen as something that is a subjective good, not a tool of kind of objectification. And so she takes aim at some of the French theorists who have either venerated or denigrated vision for either, you know, othering or being like a way to affirm a kind of subject position where she doesn't want to say either. She's going to say something completely different, but she sort of summarizes their positions as follows. Uh, So she takes aim at Merleau-Ponty, whose theory of vision as a common attribute among humans. So this is the, his commitment to phenomenology, phenomenology being the study of appearances as they appear to human agents, agents that have certain sensory capacities that are able to then interact with that world, which shapes them. And in turn, you know, the, the human is able to give kind of bestow meaning or confer meaning onto that world. More or less, it, it, I know it's more than that, but, you know, just for now. So she takes aim at him because she he, Merleau-Ponty just says that vision is something, you know, natural to everyone. And the way that we engage with it is kind of natural. But that does not consider the ways that, you know, some people are seen very differently from others. And some people's capacity for seeing is very different from others. Of course, this is we're ignoring people that have any kind of disability, the blind, for instance, that don't see in this way that we are talking about. And so therefore their relationship, even to this discourse, it would be, could be problematized. So that's how she takes aim at Merleau-Ponty. Then there's uh, Althusé, who um, she says, sight turns people to subject of some authority. So the example that she gives from Althusé is the, uh, what happens to be, uh, through the act of interp- interpolation, where the example he gives is where a police officer yells, hey, hey, you, and you turn to to the police officer who's behind you or somewhere around you. And it's in that moment that you are rendered the subject of the authority's gaze. You knew you were being addressed, even though you no one was pointing at you, you didn't see this, but you knew you were being addressed just by, you know, the tone. And then as soon as this was revealed who it was, you are completely at their mercy. But you were almost at their mercy even before it happened because you turned. Like you were hailed is the is the thing. All right. So that turns you into a kind of subject, which Oliver is like not too fond of because she still wants to find a place for subjectivity as a good thing. You know, to be a subject is to have a holistic connection with the world and yourself here and others. Uh, then she takes uh, aim at uh, Levinas, Levina, who suggests that sight makes us one with other subjects in a communal subjectification. So again, we're hearing something about like a how this is a an almost an ontological condition. It's something that doesn't change with with different relations, which of course she wants to problematize by thinking about context. And then finally, she takes aim at Lacan where uh, he says that sight almost bridges the chasm of empty space between self and other. You know, sight is that sense that bridges ourselves with, with others. And they all, for her, are predicated too much on a kind of antagonism. Now, she's going to come to actually have some faith in Merleau-Ponty. She's going to r- use him pretty heavily in the next chapter here, which she moves right into. Um, and I'll just, let's just do it. Let's jump right in. So then move here into chapter nine, Toward a New Vision. So she starts at this chapter by saying that she wants to look at vision like any other sense. So like touch, smell, hearing, or or taste. Wants to consider it like almost along a continuum of a general sensory connectivity within like a human being that has an engagement with the exterior world and with, with others as well. So vision works alongside uh, touch and taste and, and sight and smell in order to um, engage with the world through the medium or through energy as a medium and all the energies that I presented in the first half that she talked about like the chemical the the mechanical the, the 
thermal energy, but also social energy, which she says is primarily affective. That is, it's affective energy that mediates social relations, like, for example, how emotions migrate between people. And the example she gives gives is like if you have if you have a partner uh, who happens to be really sad and they confide in you about their sadness and want to explain it, you come out of that feeling often sad. Like your partner might feel better because they were able to get it off their their chest, but then you feel sad. So there's that in that moment she's saying like there's almost an exchange of like money, like a like a, a material thing from one person to another. And that for her adduces the fact that there's some kind of energy that binds us and this energy, you know, can be exchanged with with others and it exists among us and it subtends most of our relationships. So by becoming attuned to these energies, we can become uh, responsible and addressable. That is, it, you know, we, we would be able to have a, a sort of develop empathetic response to others who, who demonstrate some kind of distress and that r rely on us, which is what she calls the kind of the biosocial energy. Now, it's here that she uses Merleau-Ponty, who she feels is trying to find what connects people, not what separates them, like in the other dialectical or Hegelian forms that we were presenting earlier, you know, between subjects and objects, where objects are always those things that are viewed as other you know, the thing that is different. Whereas for Merleau-Ponty, we are already, always already, both subjects and objects. Now, this goes back to even, even Hegel. And, you know, as a kind of an aside, I don't know, like Hegel doesn't say this stuff. I, I'm, I, that's, anyways, I'm sorry. That's an aside. For Merleau-Ponty, we are simultaneously subjects and objects. We are subjects in that we are viewing things, we are engaging with the world in a kind of somewhat autonomous way, but we are being seen by others and we are being seen ourselves, by ourselves. So we are, in that sense, given over to ourselves and given over to others as observable things, as things that can be seen. So in that way, we are objects. We, we embody both subjectivity and objectivity. So we are then kind of these creatures that have, that are both subjects and objects. We live in the the, the the steady equilibrium between the two and we have a kind of fluid engagement with what he calls i think the flesh of the world so the flesh of the world being these media like the effective energies the chemical you know thermal mechanical energies that mediate all of our relations with other people we exist within those now everyone because everyone exists within those with the same kind of faculties, the same kinds of engagements with the world through their senses, then share this. We all have this kind of common stake in the world. So it's it's not important. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. So to supplement uh, Merlo, what Merleau-Ponty says, um, uh, yeah. Kelly Oliver uses the work of Lucha, Lucha, Irigaray, Lut, Lutz, Lucha, anyways, her work, seminal work, obviously. Now, Irigaray makes the uh, kind of an added, adds to this in saying that no two people can really ever know one another. And she uses the example of like sexual difference to highlight that, where one sex will never know the life of the other sex. Now, of course, we can, we can problematize that if we consider like the way that, you know, trans bodies are not, they, they aren't mythical like they, they're very real trans people are very real and they have they certainly trouble this formulation so we can just kind of use it as a point of departure to say that okay while i recognize now that this doesn't this example doesn't really work that is the example between uh sexes or genders we can still take from what Ray says a very important lesson and that is that no two people are reducible to the other now, what that means, or to each other. Now, what that means for Irig Ray is that then no hierarchy can really ever emerge because if we accept that I cannot be reduced to the other, I cannot fully grasp the other, and therefore they cannot fully grasp me, neither of us can lay claim to a kind of superiority, which is the basis of a kind of radical um, undoing of you know hegemony. 
Yeah, okay. And then it's from there that we move here finally into the conclusion titled Witnessing the Power of Love, in which I will say she gets a little bit pie in the sky with this. Almost by like saying, like, oh, love will fix everything. And pretty much as she starts out, she says, love is a way beyond domination. So in addition to Irigure, she presents the work of Bell Hooks here, who she says, in addition to Irigure, in um, providing the template for a kind of anti-oppressive politics of love, uh, Bell Hooks gives us another way to recognize, um, you know, meaningful relations. And they, those are ones founded on love, where for Hooks, you can't really have um, a meaningful relationship if it's founded on oppression and it like no abuse can be can, can kind of be love for for hooks so love for both of these thinkers at least according to oliver is predicated upon an openness to otherness that is continually revised and interpreted that is it is connected to witnessing not recognition because recognition is you know just seeing the other and having them kind of uh, accommodate your gaze, whereas witnessing implies, along with bearing witness, you know, your engagement with yourself and an other that recognizes your humanity, that recognizes your propensity to witness yourself and doesn't, you know, discredit that. And that is more or less it. The conclusion does kind of recap a lot. Uh, but yeah, that will pretty much wrap it up. And if anyone has anything they want to add or you know if there's anything i missed or maybe i mischaracterized i'd really love to hear about it but until then thanks for tuning in i'll catch you next saturday at noon eastern time peace out <laughs>